In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you my Spell Sword build, which is sort of a variation of the Spellblade and Magus builds that I did earlier on in Elden Ring's life cycle. People have been asking you to make like a updated build for them. This is kind of an offshoot of that that focuses more on stance breaks rather than critical attack damage. Now, while the gameplay of this is from New Game Plus, I do want to mention that you can play this in New Game from very early on, but you will have to defeat Godric the Grafted in order to get Glintblade Phalanx. So there is a little bit of a, a gate there in order to get this. So you can't use it the entire game, but you're going to be able to use it the vast majority of it in a first playthrough. So moving to the weapon that I chose for this build, I chose the Claymore, and there are a couple reasons I chose this weapon. First is that the charged R2 attack is really, really strong in my opinion. It's a thrust attack. I believe only it and the Zweihander have this, and the Zweihander is a Colossal Sword and cannot use Glenblade Phalanx. And I really like being able to use this charged R2 from a safe distance and still connect without taking damage. Additionally, the charged R2 attack of Great Swords is about double that of Thrusting Swords. So while you might get more critical damage with a Rapier and deal more damage with a Critical Strike, you're not going to be able to break the guard or stance of an enemy as easily with a Thrusting Sword as you will with a Great Sword. And also, the Greatsword has very long reach, so when you're doing the follow-up attack with Glenblade Phalanx, you're actually able to hit much further than you would with like a thrusting weapon. And lastly, the follow-up attack on Glenblade Phalanx actually does stance damage about the same as a jump attack with a weapon type you're using. So if you're using a thrusting sword, it's going to deal less stance damage than a Greatsword would. And that's kind of similar to the Charge Shard 2 as well. So the way I have this weapon set up here is that I have a heavy infusion, and I am using the Academy Glintstone Staff, to use Scholar's Armament in order to buff my damage here and give me extra magic damage. I have about 50 Strength and 50 Intelligence splitting my stats between these two. If you're talking about playing this from the very beginning of the game, you probably either prioritize Intelligence or prioritize Strength to get more magic damage and do like a magic infusion or just go heavy and you know buff with whatever extra damage you can get from Scholar's Armament and not worry about Intelligence. So you're probably not going to go split early on in the game, but once you get to like New Game Plus, it's definitely a better way to go. Because even at 50-50, you have about 900 attack rating when buffed when you're using this two-handed. And that's, you know, you can take those stats up to 80-80 and still get even more damage all the way through New Game Plus. Which makes this build, you know, kind of future-proof built in. I do want to mention also that the damage with Glintblade Phalanx is actually higher if you're just talking about the Glintblades that come out. Because this deals 100% magic damage when you're using the magic or cold infusions versus the heavy infusion. But it doesn't do that much damage anyway. So you're not really building for Glintblade Phalanx damage as much as we are just trying to get some damage out of it and really get the stance damage from each blade. Each blade deals 10 stance damage, so that's 40 stance damage from Glimblade Phalanx. Then if you do a charged R2 while two ending this weapon, it's about 36 more. So that's 76 stance damage if you can hit back to back with these. And if you use the follow-up attack instead of a charged R2, you're looking at somewhere around 64 stance damage, which is pretty much enough to break almost any enemy in this game. Maybe not all bosses, but a lot of them. So really, you're trying to decide here whether after you cast Glimplade Phalanx, if it's better to use the follow-up attack and do less stance damage, but maybe more damage in general, or if it's better to use a charged R2 and get a little bit less damage, but get more stagger damage. So that's going to depend on the boss that you're facing, and also your spacing. For instance, if you cast Glimplade Phalanx ahead of time, then obviously you're going to follow up with an R2, because you can only use the follow-up attack immediately after casting Glimplade Phalanx. In terms of staff, I mentioned I'm using the Academy Glintstone staff here, and this is because this is going to give me the best sorcery scaling at this much intelligence, so it's fully upgraded. But depending on how much intelligence you have, where you are in the game, this may not be the best staff for you. For instance, the Meteorite staff might be better for you early on in the game, or the Demi-Human staff. And then obviously later in the game, the Carrion Regal Scepter, as your intelligence gets further and further into New Game Plus, will be better for you than this. When it comes to armor that I'm using for this build, I just kind of have a mod podge of different pieces here. I have the Carrion Knight Helm, the blue silver mail for my chest, and then I have black knife gauntlets and leggings to kind of round out the look I'm going for. It doesn't really matter which armor set you're using. We're just going for that 51 poise. Whatever you want is up to you. I, I use the Bullguts Talisman here to add to this in order to give me that 51 poise. But if you wanted to use a heavier armor set and free up that slot, you absolutely can. Other talismans I use for this build are the Axe Talisman to increase my Charge Star 2 damage. So we use that quite a bit. Shard of Alexander in order to increase my, not only my Glint Blades damage when they connect, but also the follow-up attack when you're using that. That'll affect both damages of both of those types. And I also have the Assassin Cerulean Dagger here to refund the cost of Glint Blade Phalanx if I hit enemies with it and stagger them and then follow that up with a critical attack. This is somewhat similar to what we did in the Spellblade and Magus builds. Other talismans you can use for this build are the Spear Talisman to increase your R2 damage and charge R2 if you hit enemies while they are attacking you, which happens a lot during boss fights. Or maybe, you know, when enemies are out on the landscape and they're kind of running at you and you use your charge star too. 
or you can use something like the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman in order to give yourself more protection. The Magic Scorpion Charm is also not a bad option for this build because it will increase the damage of the Glim Plates themselves by 10% since they do 100% magic damage and a little bit of the follow-up attack as well and any regular attacks you do if you have magic damage on your weapon, such as if you chose the Magic Infusion early on in the game or if you have it buffed with Scholar's Armaments, but it will increase the damage you do so it's not like the go-to here, but it's one you could use. Other than that, spell-wise, we only really use Scholar's Armament, but you have 50 Intelligence, so there are a lot of different spells you can do. You could drop Terra Magica to further boost your magic damage, though you don't deal a ton of magic damage with this build, so I don't find that super useful. You know, and they're just ranged spells you could equip to give you a modest amount. With 50 Intelligence, you're not really, particularly New Game Plus, not really going to be slaughtering anything, but you could pick off enemies at a distance, you know, or, or soften them before they got to you if you want. This whole build is really about staggering enemies, so this is not something I factored in here, but if you want to use other spells, you can. When it comes to attributes we use for this build, I have 54 Vigor, 25 Mind, 25 Endurance, 50 Strength, 13 Dexterity, 50 Intelligence, 7 Faith, and 9 Arcane. We don't need any Faith or Arcane for this build whatsoever, and 54 Vigor is really just enough for you to be able to like trade damage and not die. You try not to trade damage with this build, but you do sometimes when you miss time things, and you'll probably take this up to 60 Vigor throughout New Game Plus. Mind is at 25 here. You do use some FP, but you don't use a ton. First of all, Glintblade Phalanx doesn't use a lot of FP, and you do use a significant amount buffing with Scholar's Armament from checkpoint to checkpoint, but it's not like a substantial amount. Like, it's not so much that like you need to tank Mind up to 30 or 35. It doesn't cost as much as Golden Vow or anything like that. You will want to keep that buff up 100% of the time, so you will spend some FP doing that and using Glintblade Phalanx, but you should get some back from Assassin Serling Dagger. So if you're really thrifty with the way you play, you could probably drop this down like 5 points even. But, you know, sometimes I'm not, so I just have 25 here. 25 Endurance allows us to use all the equipment that you see and still medium roll. You can take Endurance up higher if you want, use a heavier armor set, pull out Bull Coats, Talisman, give yourself more protection. If you're talking about min-maxing, that's probably what you would do here. But I haven't done that, I've just kind of kept my points down in order to increase my damage more. But in more Endurance will not hurt this build because you do use a lot of stamina with it as well. We have 50 Strength and 50 Intelligence here. We have good scaling with heavy scaling on the Claymore, so points into Strength are good. We have good Sorcery scaling with S on the Academy Glintstone Staff, and obviously we'll swap that out for Carrion Royal Scepter when we hit about 65-ish Intelligence or something like that, somewhere in that ballpark. So taking, you know, Strength and Intelligence up is going to increase your damage even more. Like, both of these are really good. Really just depends on whether you want more magic damage or whether you want more damage from the weapon itself. I suggest putting strength up first because that way you'll get more counter damage when you attack because this only applies to physical damage uh, when enemies are attacking you with your you know your R2 and your charged R2s and also your regular attacks. But you can take intelligence up first if you'd rather be more of a spellcaster. Dexterity 13 is really only needed for the requirements of the Claymore. We don't take it up at all because of the heavy scaling that we have on here, so you don't want to adjust this whatsoever. And just some final tips before we wrap up this video. When it comes to the Flask of Wonders Physique, I like to use the Green Burst Crystal tier in order to give me more stamina recovery, but also the Stone Barbed Crack tier in order to get more stance damage for 30 seconds. This is going to make it so you stance break bosses super fast with this build, and usually they can't even do anything for 30 seconds, and they usually die before 30 seconds is even over. So make sure you use this in boss fights. If you want, you can also use the Magic Shrouding Crack tier with this instead of the Green Burst Crystal tier in order to give yourself a bit more magic damage but it's not going to be a substantial amount. When it comes to Great Runes, you're going to probably want to use Godric's early on because you have six stats you need summon. That would free up points from Dexterity that you don't have to place in order to use the Claymore. Um, but you may need to put them there anyway in case you're not using a Great Rune just to be able to use your weapon. So it would really be more like five stats. It's not a bad one early on, but Radon's is also really good. Stamina is good for this build. FP is good for this build. Health is good for this build. So it's a good one too. And one last thing I want to mention before I wrap up this video is that you gain 10% more stance damage from your attacks when you're two-handing a weapon. So that's not going to apply to like an Ash of War that you use, but it will apply to the weapon attacks of a weapon. So if you deal 33 stance damage with a charged R2 single-handed on a Claymore, which is what you do, you'll actually do like 36 point something when you two-hand it. That'll, you know, that adds up. Sometimes a boss or an enemy, you know, can't be staggered with 66 stance damage, but it can be staggered with 70 or something like that. Particularly when you start adding other multipliers like the Stone Barb Crack tier that gives another 30%, sometimes you can stagger things way, way faster. So that's why we two-hand here in order to get more stance damage because that's what we're really going for in this build. And that wraps up our Spell Sword video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope for those of you out there that were asking for a, you know, kind of evolution of the Spellblade and Magus build, see why I kind of pivoted in a different direction. 
Stance Breaks was really the strength of those early builds because of using Glimblade Phalanx and getting the critical damage with Rapier made it really, really high, but it was harder to Stance Break. Now it's easier to Stance Break, but you get less damage with those critical attacks, but I feel like that's just safer in general because you don't have to worry about an enemy attacking you when they're Stance Broken. So, hope you enjoy the build. If you have any comments or questions, we have more Elder Ring content coming.